at one time, he, Spencer, Herbert Spencer, was one of the most uh, respected and, and well-known philosophers in the world. Isn't that right? Yes. His books are translated into many, many languages, probably more than any other philosopher of his time. So he was also a psychologist a bio, and a, a sociologist and, and a political theorist and a religious theorist. So he had a lot of things that was on his plate and that uh, allowed for a lot of appreciation. Well, he was also a mystic, wasn't he? Well, he believed, yeah, in one sense he was. He believed that there was an element of reality that we couldn't know, but we knew was there. That element of reality, he didn't call it God, he called it the unknowable. And he thought that when you're, when you, uh, you know, a pitiful human, you might say, a person with limited knowledge, approached the, uh, the ineffable, one should have a little bit of respect. And that was his idea of worship, I think, was that idea of the unknowable. And uh, though I find it a rather peculiar notion, uh, it was very, very important in Victorian England. Well, it's important now. There, I mean, it, 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 um, it necessitates a certain degree of humility in, any, any, in everybody. Right. And that was actually one of his points. He says that the, the more we expand knowledge, the boundaries of our nescience become clearer and nescience as being the absence of knowledge, and he was a great appreciator of just how little we knew, and he thought that people should be circumspect in that. Uh, many people found irony in the fact that he was a person who was a lover of facts, and a collector of facts, and a collector of theory, well, yeah, and a advisor never. of theory, and went on and on and on about what we knew, uh, but but and that's what he did, and that's what we can't help but do. As human beings, that's what our job is, is to learn more. Uh, well, why has he fallen out of favor? Oh, well, he's fallen out of favor primarily first because he was a libertarian. And in 1900, being a libertarian was not going to be a popular activity for anyone. Uh, that was the beginning of the end of, of, of uh, the age of liberalism and the beginning of the, the age of socialism and war. Well, how do you define liberalism? Well, how he defined liberalism and how everybody defined it in the 19th century, which was as the, uh, the support for the rule of law and, uh, uh, as, as it pertains to individual liberty. Liberal pertains to liberty. It pertained to restraining the state and limited government. That's what it was. Uh, liberal was for, was the kind of people who were against warfare as a policy, thought the military men were very, very dangerous and preferred diplomacy and the liberals also uh, wanted free trade and thought that was the answer to the problems of uh, uh, inter-community warfare and uh, in interstate warfare, because, which kept on coming up. And as soon as people traded with each other, they, they realized that they'd be in bad shape if they went to war. Well, we've, we we've, found that out. We've since found out that the state is an important protector of individual liberty, though. So. A, a blanket dismissal of... Well, he didn't, he didn't dismiss the state. He had, in fact, uh, large sections of his book, Social Statics, uh, devoted to the duties of the state. I would say there are almost as many chapters on the duties of the state as there is the charge of uh, chapters on the limits of the so state. So he came to accept the state and, and support it. Yeah, he did. That is true. So what kind of a libertarian could he have been, really? He, That's what he, libertarians accept, are. he accepted modern liberalism, the idea that the state is necessary and can do good. Um... He well, that's not what modern liberalism is. The well, modern liberalism is the, is the idea the maximum maximum unlimited state can mess it about in every area of life uh, and do good. And he didn't believe that at all because he knew that there were extreme limits to state power and state competence. And in fact, he was worried about competence and what is it that makes us learn from our actions? And that's what he was a social theorist. And that's one of his uh, that's one of his inquiries. And he knew real he knew. Good and well that the that uh, bureaucrats and politicians uh, lumber along on a, on, a, on a track that is not very efficient and actually does a lot of harm, and it takes a great deal of brainwashing, which I think modern liberals who are really progressives, who are really just socialists, who've uh, been, oh there you go with the S word. No, well, he was a, uh, Spencer was a major opponent of socialism, and he predicted that socialism uh, would lead to ruination. Well, define socialism. Well, well, socialism was in the 19th century, and it was until socialists ran curing into the corner with a tail a bit, a shivering between their legs, peed on after they after every one of their major experiences had proved to be. Sorry, hard. was peed on a French philosopher or? Yeah, he was. Yeah, uh, peed on. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Basically, socialists believed in uh, socialists were people who a hated markets and private property. That's the first thing we need to be a socialist. Well, property staff, so that's understood. Yeah, that's what they did. And socialists also, uh, when my market, they didn't believe in free trade. They didn't like people trading things at all. Well, they, they, wanted every, they wanted everyone to work 
together and pool their resources and put it into a common into a common uh, uh, store and then take out as needed. Well, you're making fun of it, but that's, that's yes, a benevolent view of humanity. Well, except there's no reason to believe it works, and Spencer showed why it wouldn't work. Well, if you're a pessimist, that's true, but some of us believe we can better humankind and, and make these high ideals work. Well, there's been no evidence that that system works. Uh, socialism, well, now, that's not quite true. Socialism, like anything, is limited to the area where, it, uh, where it's competent. Socialism kind of works in the family. Socialism kind of works in the church. Basically, get, taking from all or taking from some and giving to others, not based on their their needs of uh, cooperation, where you're not, it's not trade cooperation, or it's not one-on-one, -on -one, but where it's a cooperation among several people trying to obtain one thing that is then divvied out either an equal share out or an unequal share out, depending on the situation, um, is an important principle of, of cooperation and works in small groups. We know this because of the knowledge problem. Uh, it works in families, works in churches to some degree, works in community groups where people engage in a variety of activities, uh, where people engage in a variety of activities, and they share then in the outcome. Uh, it gets much more difficult when you try to scale that to all of society because uh, at some point people begin treating the common store uh, and the common effort in rather uh, different ways. Uh, why w people begin to shirk uh, their work uh, in, the, in the common effort if what they put in doesn't have any bearing on what they come get out. If what they get out isn't dependent on what they put in, then people are encouraged, like in all elements of human life, uh, we try to get the most for the least. The problem with socialistic uh, organiza organizations, that is organizations wherein the common work and the share out are based on different principles. They're based on need or an ability rather than on uh, wants and desires and, and income inputs and outputs. Uh, then people start shirking the uh, input and taking more of the output. This almost led to the death of the pilgrims when they came to, to uh, Plymouth Rock and uh, they had to actually privatize their land. They started out in a communitarian fashion. Uh, they were religious people. They thought it was good that people should work together for the common good. They tried it and they almost died. Most of them did. And finally when they shared, put up family plots uh, and each had his own, uh, each family had their own plot and worked it, they started, they started accumulating wealth and they could share it with each other at their Thanksgiving feast, but they didn't share it every day of the week and that allowed them to survive and trade allowed them to survive and it was private property that allowed them to survive. So there are limits, uh, but within the families they still had, you know, the father did more, you know, backbreaking work and the mother did more picking and the, the children did even more picking and the, you know, they picked the back, you know, they had, they, they, they had a diversi diversified workload and the children did much less than the parents, of course, but the children got everything they needed then, whereas under socialism, when a whole community was working together to provide one output what they would all share, they were basically starving and dying in droves. And that's the problem with socialism. It doesn't scale. Socialists are people who don't understand the problems of what works in a small group doesn't work in a big group. We know that families behave differently than communities and firms, and we know that there's a limit on our ability to even engage in communities, and corporations often div make divisions so that the that, that limit of, a, what is it, 150, 250 around there, that's the limit of our social experience and the way we can handle, uh, we, way we can handle uh, social cues and social hierarchies. And uh, socialists are just dreamers who really don't understand how society works. Well, you can rationalize it all you want, but all I'm saying is we should share. We should share with one another and not just live in a dog-eat-dog, -dog, uh, winner-take-all society in which the rich make all the decisions and get all the rewards. Well, um, I think we do share. We should share. That's, that's true. And I, that's, that's fine. Uh, should we be shared at a point of a gun? When the, people, when the point of the gun gets there, there's a lot of corruption that gets in the game. And government, by the way, is about the point of the gun. So at that point, your sharing and caring becomes share, care, bang. Uh, that's not exactly a good way of uh, going about uh, organizing all society. And dog eat dog is a peculiar institute, uh, uh, phrase since I've ever, never actually seen a dog eat dog. I've seen dogs eat dog poo, 
but I've never seen dog eat dog. So it's a very bizarre little uh, phrase. And we don't, in a market society, eat each other. What we do is we trade with each other, which is cooperate, which is actually share, is that I share my ability to do this with the person who hires me and, and, and he gives me some money and then uh, I go out and uh, share my money with some other guy who gives me food and well, there's a lot of this sharing going on but we do it on, on a rational basis and it turns out that we actually advance and get better because we can actually calculate our advantages and we have some standards for achievement and it gives us some really good incentives to do better uh, under socialism it's, it's, it's a wish but it's, it's, it's a wish and a dream but it doesn't work and if it doesn't work, we can't advance it as, a, as anything that's workable or that's anything good. If it doesn't work, it's not good. If it cannot work, it is not good. It becomes a Well, evil. we've seen that, for instance, the capitalist system doesn't work either, as, as the recent crash shows. So we need to move on to some third way, obviously. Well, we were in the third way, and that crashed. I mean, to, say, to pretend that we had laissez-faire would be, of course, uh, silly. Uh, we did not have laissez-faire. Laissez-faire, I think, works better than a managed system, managed by people who don't know what they're doing, and in fact... Yeah, yeah, I know. You think the market always finds out what's right. Well, there's some kind of magic power to it. Well, there is a kind of a, there's an interesting, it's not a magic, it's just feedback loops. It has feedback loops, and in politics and bureaucracy, the feedback loops are very, very... Uh, disorganized, stretched, broken, uh, distended. They just don't work very well. I mean, we, there's, there's a whole de developed sciences of this. And if anyone were interested in, in learning about it, they could actually look it up. Who, who would you go to as a good example? Well, I mean, uh, bureaucratic incentives. You can go to Niskanen. Uh, the whole uh, economics of politics uh, was started with a number of people, including Tulloch and Buchanan. And uh, there's a lot been written about this, but some of this is very old knowledge. The classical liberals knew the limitations of human ability, and therefore they wanted limited government to make sure that people didn't go beyond their, uh, uh, their competences. And uh, we're simply incompetent in areas where we do not have decent feedback loops. Government does not provide that feedback loop. Democracy is the clunkiest device known to man. Oh, so you're against democracy. No, I'm just now saying we're that, putting our cards on the table. Well, I'm actually for the kind of democracy the people of the world want. We want the democracy that people have rights to live their lives and choose what they want to do. And, uh, that, and that's backed up by a government that's limited and controlled somewhat by the people. Well, this is what we've got. That we have a Elections. Yeah, but they only work. They don't work very well, especially when you hire somebody to do something and they do the opposite, and you can't get rid of them. And then he says, "Well, at least he's better than the next guy." There's a lot of weird, weird incentives in politics, and uh, certainly I prefer that some things actually be done directly by the people. But I don't want the people to be deciding whether we're going to kill Jews or not. We want a rule of law. You know, we, we don't. We want a rule of law that protects minorities and individuals. It's down to the individual letter level we want protected. We want the rights, and some people around the world. Just think of democracy as a system that provides us our rights. And the rights to liberty preclude a lot of things that the modern state does and, and makes us worse off than we would otherwise be.